It's time for me to half-ass another Star Trek video, which means this is not actually Trek Actually. And this time, I am once again going to be offering responses to some of the comments that you fine folks have left on previous episodes of Trek Actually and Not Actually Trek Actually. So let's get started right away. Oh, one quick note. In the previous edition of uh, Not Actually Trek Actually, where I did comment responses about two months ago, I did a gimmick where I blurred out the name and the user pics of the people who left the comments because I felt like it was unfair to feature comments from people that uh, hadn't given me permission to use them in the video. But then I, I realized that, you know, that Mike Rugnetta guy does it. And if he can get away with it, why can't I? He's way more internet famous than I am, and everybody seems cool with it. So if you don't mind, this time, and going forward, unless there's a huge problem with it, I will be sharing the comments as they appear on the videos uh, with user picks and names and all. So I hope that's okay. I'll be nice to the people who are leaving the comments, and I hope that all of you will be nice to them as well. Please no bullying. Please no harassment. Please no bullshit. Okay? Thanks. Now, let's go on with the first comment. This is a comment left on the most recent Trek Actually video, the one titled Actually Star Trek Has Always Been Preachy by Rob062388. And it says, LOL, I love how that Reddit post was downvoted to hell. Most Trekkies, luckily, can't stand that garbage. Are you a regular user on the Star Trek subreddit, Steve? To answer the second question first, no, I am not a regular user of the Star Trek subreddit, nor any other subreddit. I am not a regular user of Reddit at all. Uh, but that first point that you raise in your comment is a good one, and it's one that I wish I had at least mentioned in the video which is the fans that I'm talking about in that video who complain about representation in the casts of the shows, who complain that Star Trek has recently gotten too political or that Discovery in particular is too political or too SJW, uh, that fans of that mindset seem to be a very, very small minority, a very vocal and loud and irritating faction of the fan base, but a very small minority. Here's one more comment from that most recent video. Actually, Star Trek has always been preachy. And this is from Commander Krug. Commander Krug says, murder of David at the hands of, oi, I never even touched the guy. I was all the way up on the ship. That other guy killed him. Uh, what was his name? One of the dudes down on the planet. Yes, that, that's my bad. That's my mistake. That was just a little screw up on my part that somehow made it through from the script to the finished product. Yes, Commander Krug himself does not kill David. He orders him to be killed. In fact, he doesn't even order David to be killed. He just says, kill one of the prisoners. I don't care which one. And uh, Savick is the intended target. And then David actually intervenes and gets himself killed in order to, to save Savick from being the one. So yes, Commander Krug, Absolutely right. A fair correction. I apologize. You only ordered him to be murdered. You did not murder him yourself. I hope that we're square. Thanks for commenting. Oh, all right. I know just a moment ago I said that was the last comment from the Actually Star Trek Has Always Been Preachy video, but I do have one more that I just can't resist responding to, and it is from Admiral Sizor, who says Rod Serling had a remote control for his TV. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't know for a fact if he did or not. I'm not sure what TV Rod had and whether or not he had or used a remote control. But the remote control, even though most people probably didn't have them in, in the 60s because they did make the TV a lot more expensive, uh, remote control technology did exist. Remote controls for TVs were introduced in the 50s. And while I don't know for a fact, I think it is at least plausible that a big shot like Rod Serling, which he would have been in the mid to late 60s, following on the Twilight Zone and leading into... Uh, Night Gallery, which was his, his other show that he did in the years after Twilight Zone, I think it's plausible that Rod uh, saved enough of his money to have bought himself a nice TV and, and to have had a, a remote control to go with it. So yeah, yeah, I think it's it's reasonable to say Rod did have a remote control for his TV. And when he saw Let That Be Your the, your Last Battlefield and he saw the, the half black, half white gimmick and he saw how heavy handed and, and, and perfectly outlandish and silly and on point it was, I, yeah, maybe he did have that remote in his hand and he threw it at the TV and he said, ah, damn it, I wish I had thought of it. This next one is from my video from a couple of months ago about the Borg, who actually ruined the Borg, and it's by my buddy Firefly4F4. Hey, Firefly4F4, he says, um, 
I'm not sure I buy your explanation for Picard's insight in First Contact. It wasn't that he knew about the weak spot all along, it's that, for whatever reason, he still has some residual connection to the Collective and was able to gain real-time insight into where to attack. It was knowledge specific to that cube at that time. I will grant it's a little weakly explained why he's able to hear this at the time. My best guess is the Queen, ah, yeah, she was a bad idea, reactivated some dormant chip in his head that was left over. I think this is a fair point, and you're right, it's not a perfect explanation. There are still some problems with it, but maybe that is a better explanation than just assuming that Picard knew the whole time and, and kept it to himself. But uh, not only Firefly 404, but a couple other people who commented on that video pointed out that in addition to Picard uh, hearing the Borg telling Troy, you know, I can hear them, which might explain how he knew where to shoot, he also was having dreams about the Borg at the beginning of the film, which we probably should not treat as a coincidence. You know, he has the dream about the Borg and he wakes up and then the Admiral is contacting him and the Admiral says, bad news, Jean-Luc. And he's like, oh yeah, I know the Borg because he's had a premonition about it through his dreams. So yeah, yeah, I think it's a reasonable explanation. The problem with it is that he has faced the Borg previously since his assimilation. The Enterprise encountered the Borg a couple of times in Next Generation after he was rescued from his Locutus abduction, and he didn't experience anything like that. He didn't hear the Collective when they were in the vicinity of the Borg ship, uh, when they picked up Hugh. He didn't hear the Collective. Chris, I guess you could say he wouldn't have necessarily heard the Collective in Descent, because they those Borg were not part of the Collective. But he's encountered Borg before, and he didn't have that reaction. He didn't hear them. He didn't, at least not that we were shown. Uh, and if we weren't shown it, it didn't happen. Uh, he wasn't having dreams about them or anything. So it's not a perfect uh, explanation, but yeah, I, I think it's probably a, a more plausible explanation than my version in the video where I just treat it as though he knew the whole time where the weak spots on the cubes were, and he just decided not to tell them until he had his chance to swoop in against orders and, and be a big hero. It's probably not a very Picardian thing to do. This one is also from that who actually ruined the Borg video, and it is by Anna Alou, who says, comment that completely misses the point and repeats something Steve said in the video so she can be in the next mailbag. Mission accomplished, Anna. Though in response to the final comment slash criticism, I'd argue Voyager did invent the Borg Queen. That is to say, their version of it. The Queen comes off as a sort of avatar of the Collective, the very reason the producers used her in the movie in the first place. Something that can easier interact with the world, perhaps with the all-important role of tiebreaker if a logic loop can't be talked to death internally, perhaps some sort of focusing iris for the Collective's thoughts when they decide on a plan and need some feedback on the ground from an individual perspective. Voyager's queen is literally a queen, with her dumb throne room, and her stupid bottomless pits, and her molecatron rays. She frequently can't read drones' minds, frequently gives orders countermanding drones, which implies they don't share a will, and frequently goes on megalomaniac rants and murders her own people just for the hell of it. So, you know, the perfect mirror for Janeway. I think this is a really sharp observation, yeah, and I think you're right that Voyager depicted the Borg queen as more of a literal queen than she was in First Contact. You remember in First Contact, she says at one point when Data is sort of trying to figure out how she relates to the rest of the Borg, she says, I am the Collective. She doesn't say, I lead the Collective or I rule the Collective. She says, I am the Collective. And the Borg Queen in Voyager is much more like the boss, a way less interesting dynamic. The idea of her being the individual that is the embodiment of the whole. The idea of her being the Borg, the entire vast billions and billions and billions of minds Borg collective in a single person and having all those resources at her fingertips and in her mind. That's an intriguing idea. And in Voyager, in practice at least, that was not at all what she was. And that's a shame. This comment was left on the last comment responses video that I did. So, uh, yeah, let's feed the snake its own tail. Dunin Newt says, can it be considered racist 
if all of McCoy's comments of that kind are specific in nature slash wording and are solely directed at only one person who he is friends with as part of their typical back and forth banter between them and mostly done while their captain and mutual friend Kirk is in the picture, usually between them as a foil, rather than being aimed in general at all Vulcans or all aliens. When I look at McCoy's comments in the context of when and where he says them, I see it more as a condemnation not on Spock's species, but rather on his lack of humanity, as McCoy sees it, as in his lack of feelings and empathy for what is happening right now. Right then, in the events to which they are involved in or discussing when he says them, because of the fact that Spock is half-human, half of what McCoy is, and in his way, it is as if McCoy is unable to forgive Spock for not acknowledging that part of himself that he shares with McCoy. I would like your thoughts on this point. Thanks. Well, here's the bottom line for me. McCoy is giving Spock shit for being Vulcan. Or at the very least, even if we interpret it the way you say, and he's not meaning to give him shit for being Vulcan, but rather he is trying to uh, chide him for not being, for not embracing his human side or not reacting with enough humanity and compassion and empathy to a given situation. Even if we interpret it in that way, he's still using Spock's Vulcanness as a weapon against him. He's still insulting him on the basis of him being Vulcan. And he is using his, his pointed ears, his green blood, stereotypes about Vulcan behavior and culture against Spock as a means to insult him and belittle him. And that's racist. If you take it from Vulcan to a white person saying things like that to a black person, and they are not intending to denigrate all black people, but they are focusing it just on this black individual who happens to be a good friend of theirs, but they are still using their blackness as a basis to insult them. I think that's racist. This, no matter what their intentions are, no matter what the, the scope of what they are saying is, even if they don't mean to demean and insult all black people. They're just focusing it on that one person in this one situation as a response to one set of circumstances. I still think it's racist. I don't think it's cool to use a person's race or, or species in this case, uh, analogous to race, as a basis to insult them and belittle them and demean them. I think that's racist. And I think what McCoy does is racist. And I say that as someone who loves the character of McCoy. I feel like I have to underline that. I'm not saying McCoy is terrible and nobody should like McCoy. I'm saying that that isn't, maybe that we could call that an oversight, a big oversight on the part of, uh, of the writers of the original Star Trek, that they didn't get why that might be a problem. This next one is a relatively recent comment left on my very first Trek Actually video, the Captain Jellico video from Joanna Metz. And Joanna says, Jellico's decisions are correct. His execution is horrible. He's a bad officer because he doesn't inspire his people. Leaders inspire tyrants order. In a battle, he might make someone hate him and friendly fire on him. Jellico's emotional IQ is low. If he was your boss, you'd hate him too. Once again, I think this is a very good point that I overlooked or at least left out of my video when I was writing it. Uh, I was trying to focus on the positive side of Jellico, sort of the overlooked positive side of Jellico, instead of treating him as a villain or as a negative character simply because he wasn't Captain Picard or he had a different leadership style than Picard. I was trying to look at the ways in which he was effective and the ways in which he actually did a lot of good in that episode and behaved very heroically, or, or at least got heroic results. But I do think it's, it's entirely fair to point out that Jellico's management style, first of all, he clearly doesn't mesh very well with the crew. There is a lot of antagonism between him and not just Commander Riker, but also Geordi and other members of the crew. And I think it's fair to point out that yes, he doesn't seem to inspire the crew. He does seem to have a very sort of look well, I mean, his catchphrase, his catchphrase isn't make it so. His catchphrase is get it done, which I know was not an accident. The writers came up with that and I'm sure patted themselves on the back uh, quite energetically when they said, oh, that's perfect. You know, that, that tells you the difference between him and Picard and just that one sentence. He says, get it done. He doesn't care what you have to say. He doesn't want you to make it so. He's not your buddy. He's not your dad. He's not your teacher. He's your boss. Get it done, right? Uh, and that's and that's great. That's very smart. But I think your your point is valid. 
He probably does have a low emotional IQ. He probably doesn't give enough thought to the feelings of the crew or to how they view him. In fact, at one point in the episode, he hands that stuff off to Deanna. You know, she, she tells him, oh, hey, the crew is not really adjusting too well to all of your changes. And he basically tells her, look, I don't have time for that shit. You need to take care of that if that's going to be a problem. That's your job. Thanks a lot. Bye. Yeah, it's a very, you, you have a very valid point, Joanna. And again, it's not, maybe not something that I would have included in the video because that was not the point I was trying to make. That was not the argument I was meaning to present, but a, a very fair sort of counter to the, uh, the position that I present in that uh, Captain Jellicoe video. This next one is from the Is Captain Janeway Actually a Great Captain video. It's from One Wibble 2, and they say, Personal Vendetta Against Voyager. Check. A personal vendetta against Voyager would be like if, uh, you know, Jerry Ryan was driving the car that ran over my dog. Oh, Voyager! You know? Now it's personal, right? Or if uh, I had, if Kate Mulgrew had promised to water my plants while I was on vacation and I came back and the plants were all dead. Ugh, Voyager! That would be a personal vendetta. I don't have anything personal against Voyager. There are some episodes of it that I think are really terrific. And there are even the really terrible episodes I don't hate. I'm 38 years old. I'm a grown-up. I don't hate Star Trek Voyager. I think a lot of it is bad, or at least mediocre. I think it probably has more bad and mediocre stuff than any other Star Trek series, in my opinion. But I don't hate it. And I don't, I don't think if you like it that it means you're a bad person, necessarily. That was a joke. Not a personal vendetta. Just a matter of taste. This next one is a comment left on my video, SJW's Invented Star Trek. It's from Michael Pohoreski. Hmm, STD. Not exactly a great acronym for the new Trek. Well, and it's not the acronym for the new Trek, Michael, and I think you probably know that. The official acronym used as an abbreviation for discovery by Star Trek, by Star Trek.com at least, is DSC. And on Memory Alpha, they use DIS, the first three letters of... Uh, of the title, Discovery. So no, nobody officially calls it STD. People who call it STD are people who are intentionally trying to shit on the show. It's not the abbreviation, is it? This next one was left on my video, Is the Transporter Actually a Murder Machine? And this is from Isabel Taylor, who says, has anyone in Star Trek ever claimed the transporter transports you whole but out of phase? Phase shifting technology is pretty novel in the Star Trek universe. It seems odd that the Romulans would be risking so much for the technology in the next phase if they could just interrupt a transporter midway and achieve the same effect. The transporter operating by beaming people whole but phased from one place to another is something that I have inferred. I don't think it's ever been explicitly nailed down that that's the way the transporter operates, but there is a lot of circumstantial evidence to that effect. And the biggest piece that I can think of is in the episode Realm of Fear, which I, I believe I mentioned in that transporter episode of, of Trek, actually, where there are, there are those shots of Barkley during transport, and you actually get to see what someone sees and what they experience during transport. And you see that they remain conscious during the entire transport. And Barclay at one point refers to being in the matter stream and being surrounded by phased matter. And I presume that phased matter would include him. So I draw the conclusion that it's at least plausible to say that the transporter works by keeping you whole but phasing you so you can pass through solid objects and you can go very quickly. You can be shunted very quickly from place to place but remain a, a whole... Uh, individual instead of being taken apart and put back together. But there's other ways of interpreting it. And there, there are times when the transporter is, is being discussed by other characters and they do seem to say unambiguously that you are taken apart and put back together. So it's, it's, it's inconsistent. Um, but I do think there is circumstantial evidence that that is at least one possible way that the transporter works. This next one is from my How Deep Space Nine Actually Gets Religious Tolerance Right video. It's from Graham Kennedy, who says, I always found it a little strange 
that Sisko would have this attitude, but then when he encounters the Jem'Hadar, he would constantly denounce their belief in the Founders as gods. And by this attitude, I believe Graham is referring to Sisko always having a great respect for the beliefs of the Bajarans, and when the Bajarans would refer to the wormhole aliens as prophets and, and treat them as gods, Sisko was always very understanding and very respectful of that. And yeah, yet when the uh, when the, the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar refer to the Founders as gods, he's very dismissive of that. I think there is a distinction to be made there, however, and that is there's not any indication, at least that I can remember, that that the wormhole aliens intentionally engineered the Bajarans to worship them as gods. They say they're of Bajor, they sort of have a protective role of Bajor and of the Bajaran people, but we don't get the sense that they engineered the Bajarans to worship them as gods, and certainly not for their own benefit. The prophets don't seem to have engineered the, the Bajaran religious faith in order to benefit them in any way. Whereas the founders have engineered a religious belief, a religious devotion to them in the Jem'Hadar and in the Vorta, and it is clearly self-serving. This next one is a comment that was left on my Prime Directive video by Biff322, who says, when you started talking about Jar Trek instead of Star Trek, you lost me. Here's the thing, Biff. Uh, a couple of points, actually. The first point is, I like the Kelvinverse movies. And I know a lot of my fellow Star Trek fans don't like them, and they don't like them for a variety of reasons. And if you don't like them, that's fine. We can agree to disagree on that. I like them. I think all three of them are good, and I think especially Star Trek Beyond is very good and holds up very well compared with the other films in the franchise, the original cast movies and the next-gen movies. But even besides that, if I didn't like them, I would still talk about them when I'm talking about Star Trek if there's a reason to bring them up, because they are part of Star Trek. They exist, whether you like them or not. They're part of the franchise. And I mentioned Star Trek Into Darkness in that Prime Directive video because its opening sequence deals with Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and, and the rest of the Enterprise crew doing something, undertaking a mission that is extremely involved with the Prime Directive and referencing it and talking about it and also the scene that follows with Admiral Pike talking to Kirk and Spock about how what they did uh, upheld the, the letter of the Prime Directive but not the spirit, that enabled me to make some points in my video that I thought were interesting and important about the way the Prime Directive is depicted in Star Trek. It would seem silly to me to not mention that or to not cite that example because it's a Kelvinverse movie as opposed to a prime timeline movie. That just seems childish to say, oh, but that, I can't talk about that. That's not real Star Trek. It's as real as the rest of Star Trek. It's part of the franchise. Whether you, whether you think it's good or not, it's there. And if it's useful to me to reference it, I'm going to do it. And I would do that even if I didn't think it was good. And if me even mentioning it or discussing it in context with other types of Star Trek and treating it as though it is just as much Star Trek as other shows or other movies. If me just simply doing that is enough for me to lose you, then you probably shouldn't be watching my videos in the first place. This next comment was left on my Captain Picard video. It's from Michael Waller, who says, the episodes that have always defined to me, how Picard knew he was not a Superman, still had human vulnerabilities, were the two-part Chain of Command and the movie First Contact. At the end of Chain of Command, Picard is physically and mentally broken to the point that he actually sees five lights. There were only four, but Cardassian interrogator insisted there were five. But through his will to not be broken, he still defiantly said he saw four lights, though Picard himself hinted he was almost ready to give up, and many viewers have stated that his final defiance was due to him knowing it was over and that he was going home. In First Contact, it is pointed out after Picard destroys his office that he is fighting the Borg out of revenge, not out of preservation. You can immediately tell the second that it dawns on Picard that the person is correct in the assessment and goes back to being the captain trying to save lives. These two instances show that Picard is still human, but he raises himself to be better even when he himself is unable to see the flaw and is always working to improve even himself. Well, thanks for that comment, Michael. Two really good points. 
I think I mentioned in the Captain Jellico video that uh, the Chain of Command two-parter is maybe my favorite next-gen episode of all, and particularly the second part where you have that great tour de force between Patrick Stewart and uh, David Warner, who's playing opposite him as Gul Madred, his, his Cardassian tormentor. Fantastic episode. And yeah, both of those moments, the moment when he stands up to him at the end when he's been released and he says, there are four lights. And then, at, then after that, when he's back on the Enterprise, when he admits to Deanna that he was broken, that he saw five lights and that if they hadn't come in when they did, he, he was ready to, to say anything to, to make the torture stop. Uh, fantastic scene and a great insight into Picard's character and a great way of, of seeing that, yes, he has a great strength, but he is also human. And that first contact bit that you point out, I love because that's something that a lot of people, including myself, tend to gloss over. I, like a lot of people, take the position that, that Picard in the movies is different in some fundamental ways from Picard in the TV series. He's and mainly that's that's for the convenience of of doing uh, of doing action movies uh, for the film series, where Picard is much more of an action hero. He's not the thoughtful, com contemplative, philosophical guy that he is in the TV series. He's much more of an action hero. Um, but that scene in First Contact shows us that he is still the same person. That this is still at the bottom, uh, the, the same man that we've seen in Next Generation, because, uh, yes, he, he goes off on that rant, you know, the line must be drawn here, and he's, I will make them pay for what they've done. And then he draws back. Lily says, you know, you broke your little ships, and, and says Captain Ahab has to go hunt his whale. And uh, that gets through to him. He realizes that he's gone too far. He realizes that he is following the path of revenge, that he is not acting like the enlightened person that he uh, that he has said that he is. And that shows not only that Picard is the same person, and Picard is capable of making a mistake, of going too far, and then also of winding it back and, and taking a hold of himself and saying, I can't be like this, I have to be better than this. Um, it also shows that the writers of the movie understand Picard in ways that maybe they aren't always given credit for. They didn't just ruin Picard and throw seven years of characterization out the window. They showed us in that scene, maybe not in the rest of the movie, which is much more action-oriented, but they showed us in that scene that in his heart, in his mind, he's the same Captain Picard we've always known. And finally, this last comment was left on Stargazers, the video where I read the piece of Star Trek The Next Generation fanfic that I've written about the circumstances following the death of Captain Picard. This comment was left by Kathy Vickers, who says, how can they get drunk? Replicators make synthahol, which doesn't make someone drunk. For those of you who didn't watch that video or read that story, Kathy is referring to scenes in Stargazers, which is a story that is set many, many, many years after the uh, Next Generation series and the, the end of the Next Generation movies when, when Riker is an admiral and is an older person and, and it's in the aftermath of the death of Jean-Luc Picard. And there, there are scenes where uh, Riker and also Geordi LaForge are drinking and uh, are getting drunk. They're drinking real alcohol and it is drinks that, that they've gotten from the replicator. So they do get alcoholic drinks from the replicator, not just synthol. And there is precedent for that in Next Generation. In uh, Up the Long Ladder, in the second season, Worf tells one of the Bring Lloydy colonists that are on the ship that if he wants, he doesn't have to get synthahol, he can get real alcohol out of the replicator. And also, even if you think, well, maybe there's some kind of a regulation or some kind of a setting on the replicator to stop people on a starship from just ordering as much booze as they want, uh, in the story that I wrote, Riker is an admiral, very high-ranking officer, and I figure he probably has the clearance to override that setting, if indeed it exists, and he can get as much booze as he wants out of that magic hole in the wall. So, cheers. And on that note, we will draw this round of uh, Trek Actually comment responses to a close. Thanks to all of you for leaving your comments. Whether I got to them in this video or not, I love the, the smart and funny and insightful comments that you folks leave, the great questions, the uh, counter arguments to things that I've said in the videos or, or comments that point out things that I missed or maybe should have said but didn't or didn't think of or offer different interpretations or different points of view of something that I talked about in a video. I think it's all fantastic. If you do dig Star Trek, don't forget that I don't just do these Star Trek videos here on YouTube. I'm also the co-host of a Star Trek themed comedy podcast called The Ensign's Log where myself 
and the great Jason Harding play characters. We portray low-ranking officers on a certain Federation starship that is embarking on a certain legendary five-year mission. Need I say more? We just posted our 20th episode of the Ensign's Log a couple of days ago uh, as this video goes up. So if you haven't checked it out, please check it out. If you have checked it out, uh, the, the new episodes are available through the RSS feed or on the website. The links to both of those are in the description. So check out the Ensign's Log, especially if you love these Star Trek videos that I do. If you like this work that I do here on YouTube and you want to help me continue to do it, you can become a supporter through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron. And if you pledge $5 a month or more, you get yourself a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. And the next proper Trek Actually video coming up is going to be up in probably about another three weeks or so, I would guess. It's going to be about Captain Kirk. Really looking forward to doing my first Captain Kirk centric Trek Actually video. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you join me for that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for commenting. And I'll see you next time.